Hello, this is Nathalie Gevinti from Unlimited Mindset Solutions, and I am here today with John Duddy. John, hello, how are you? I'm doing great. How about yourself? I'm very good. Thank you, John. Um, thank you so much for your time. It's an honor to be able to, um, to get your input and your view on leadership. So, John, you have over 30 years of experience in management with Boeing, ranging from manufacturing, operations, program management, and general management. Is that right? Yes, it is. Uh, it was a, I had a, several careers over my uh, career with Boeing, I'll say, is because I was able to do several different things throughout that time, and uh, it was very enjoyable and very rewarding. Excellent. And you've worked on programs including missiles and space shuttle and participating in the Mars rover ride to Mars. This is amazing, and it's only a little part of all the things that you've participated in, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, ranging from that to uh, other activities such as uh, global positioning satellites, uh, managed the business for Boeing for that, as well as uh, was able to come down here to Australia and to manage the defense business and lead the defense business here, as well as uh, lead the commercial operations as well in Melbourne. Yes, absolutely. So, because you're from the States. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, My accent gives that <laughs> I, I know all about accents. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, so you, you've lived in, in Australia for five years when, um, when you were the general manager to Boeing's largest defense um, business outside the United States and then general manager for Boeing's largest commercial business outside the United States at Boeing Aerostructures Australia. Did you find a cultural difference between managing Americans and managing Australians? Well, in, a, in one case, um, I did find that it was very refreshing to me, actually. When, when I came to Australia, uh, I have an, a fairly direct approach. Um, I like to talk to people and tell, tell them straight up what, how things are going, and, uh, and they, either they like it or they don't. And uh, when I came down here, people seemed to really enjoy the fact that I was very straight with them as well. Uh, the other thing I also like to do is uh, walk out on the shop floor, talk to different people at, at various levels of management and leadership, as well as everybody working on the shop. And, uh, and people seem to appreciate it as well, because I, but I really enjoyed having those conversations with people and getting out of my office and, and uh, being able to actually talk with everybody and see what's going on, right, wrong, or different, but at least having a conversation with people and yeah. understand a little bit about them. Yes, absolutely. And you felt they were really receptive to that type of leadership. Yeah, I believe they really did. They were. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, so, John, you have mentored over 50 individuals as well as led the implementation of mentoring programs for Boeing. And you were then asked to be an executive mentor in Boeing's executive mentoring program. Now, this was not the first time that you were recognized for your management skills as you have received many awards as manager of the year, including the Silver Knight Award and the Eagle Award. What did that mean to you to be recognized for your leadership and management skills? Well, uh, I had some people that I worked with that uh, actually submitted me for the award, and I was very appreciative for, of them. And the fact that they would put something in like that for me. Um, it, it, but at the end of the day, uh, when it came to mentoring people, when it came to the uh, various things and activities and awards that have occurred over the career, I always felt like I learned a great deal from people I mentored as well as the one that mentored, mentored me. And, uh, but it just seemed to be that uh, somebody had submitted something at the right time, I, I guess. And so it was, uh, it was humbling, but it was also very, uh, it felt, felt really good that people seemed to really think that it made a difference in their lives. Yes, so, so. absolutely. So in terms of mentor, um, is there a person in particular that comes to your mind that would have had tremendous impact on you as a leader, somebody who's mentored you, um, somebody who's guided you? Yeah, it, I guess over my career uh, there's been different aspects and different parts of different leaders that have really helped me out. But two leaders in particular, one was a guy, his name was Paul Smith. Uh, he was general manager of the missile business that I worked in and it was several years ago and uh, we still remain in contact actually, although it's been about 20 years since we've worked together. But uh, his leadership style was he was very relentless about making change. He was known as a change agent, but he would always make sure that things got done and he always followed up, followed up, followed up to make sure that things were happening and change was at the pace that he, he wanted to see as well as taking the rest of the team at the pace they wanted to be at. 
the other person, uh, his name was Jim Alba, actually. Uh, uh, he ended up uh, uh, having a great career with the Boeing Company, and uh, he recently retired about two years ago as well. But uh, what I learned from him is that uh, he invested a great deal in everyone. Uh, he, he, if you wanted to go to a course that was not cheap to go to, whatever, he would support it. But he would also would expect you to uh, take something out of it and learn from it, and uh, and also provide something back where you were more valuable member of to the business as well. He also was a big believer in the fact that uh, if, if you were uh, a friend of his or a associate of his, somebody that he had confidence in you, is because it wasn't so much your career that you were worried about, but you wanted to make sure you wanted to make a difference for other people's careers that, that in your team and also for the business. If you put the business and the team ahead of your, of your own aspiration, as far as he was concerned, that was something that you really, it was a good thing in, in his book. But, uh, but what I did, what I learned from that was not so much to impress him, but something I felt that, well, you know, that makes a lot of sense to me. So I feel like uh, that's something I feel like I should aspire to as well. Yes, so. yes, absolutely. That's, uh, would that be um, the one advice that, would you, give, that you would give to a, a new leader? Yeah, you know, there's a couple of things I would say out of that. Is, is one is uh, you're looking out for the team and that you have to make tough decisions as a leader. And it's not always going to be popular, but if you're going to do what's important for the team, you're going to do what's important for the business, and maybe it doesn't make your career look so well, that's just tough. Uh, you got to make sure that you, you, you take that team in a direction that you feel is the right thing to do, and if that means making some tough decisions in the process, you go ahead and do so. Uh, the other thing I'll say to aspiring leaders and people that really want to get in leadership positions, uh, if you volunteer uh, and, and volunteer to be a leader in volunteer organizations, you'll find that you'll learn more about leadership in a volunteer environment than you will actually in a paid environment. And the reason is, is that the volunteers that are, are you're leading, uh, they don't have to be there. All they're going to get is some volunteer t-shirt or whatever, but it's also in a cause that they believe in. So you're going to find yourself that you're going to have to inspire those people and get them to want to do things that, uh, that it's you know, not as authoritative as, as it would be from a, uh, from a business standpoint. And, uh, and I just found that, that by understanding those core values and, and understanding about how to get, to get people to, to really make change, uh, do the things that you feel will help benefit the business. If you find they want to do it, which I discovered through the volunteering aspect of it, that really seemed to make a difference when I got into the business world. So, brilliant. Good. brilliant. Thank you. So in terms of motivation, like you're saying, you need to be able to motivate people, especially in a volunteering um, environment. Yeah. We talk a lot about culture, mission, mm -hmm. vision. What are your views on that to motivate people? Did you yeah. use that yourself? Yeah, I mean, actually, you know, to prioritize it, you know, I would think uh, core values is very important. I mean, to me, that's the most important thing out of all of that. Uh, the, uh, the vision, you got to have a vision, you know, I, I, if you have to prioritize that, and that's important. And then once you have a mission, then you have a mission to go get that done. And so, and that's kind of the details of, you know, how you're going to get there from here to there. But unless everybody's on the same core value process and same set of values, that, and you will find no one ever's on the exact same set of core values, you're always going to have something different from somebody else. You got to understand that, blend that together, and make sure that you, it's not going to get in the way of each other. Because if you have somebody that's really dominating with a core value that's impeding the rest of the team, then you got to make a tough decision and have that conversation with, with that person and, and say, hey, you know, what you're, what you're doing is you bring it down the rest of the team. What do you want to do about that? I'm making you aware of it, so what do you want to do about it? So, Absolutely. So, yeah. Because you can take one person to take an entire team down that's when, right. they, when their values are not aligned. Yeah. So how do you... Um, how do you communicate the core values and how do you encourage others in the organization to communicate the core values? Well, yeah, we would uh, list them. Actually, when I first came to Boeing Aerostructures Australia, and I did this actually when I went from uh, leadership position to leadership position, what I would first do is at least lay out expectations for everybody. And uh, I had, I'd have an all-hands meeting or, or a, uh, you know, I had a town hall meeting where everybody would get together. And I would lay out expectations. But the first thing I would do is, like, okay, this is what I think your expectations would be of me. And, uh, and then say, this is what I think they should be expect of me and what as a person being on time, uh, you know, listening, uh, being able to try to do something about it, but also take the business in a certain direction. That's what I thought you would think of me. I said, however, this, this second part of this deal is these, is, these are my expectations of you. 
as a member of this organization, a member of this team, and then also go through those. Communicate them, but then, you know, that means nothing to people at first because they don't know who I am, et cetera. But then I have to demonstrate them because I've already told them, this is how I think you would want me to operate. And if there's a change in that, if I'm not exhibiting those behaviors, I want you to tell me. And, uh, and some people did and some people wouldn't. But the fact is, is that, you know, over time people felt that, yeah, well, maybe I am living up to those things. But also, you got to hold this leadership team accountable as well to be, as, you know, also exhibiting the same type of leadership behaviors as well as with the core values. So, so yeah. what I'm hearing you say is that it's one thing to communicate the core values. You need to lead by example. That's right. That's right. And also, uh, you know, a mistake I made, you know, in many times over is that I used to think that if, if I exhibited them, the leadership team would exhibit as, as well. Yeah. And uh, I found that um, just because I did didn't mean they would. And so, and then, but I'm not going to hold them exactly to, you know, 100% being a, a junior one of me, but, uh, but, you know, making sure that they've got to be their own person. But also, if there's something I see they're going way out of bounds with, then I got to go, you know, have a discussion with them and, and uh, in, in private. So, yes, so, yeah. absolutely. So, when you have somebody new that joined um, the company, yeah. Um, how do you help them understand the culture of the organization and the values? Well, the, when, when someone would new would come to the organization I'd be leading, um, usually uh, they get some orientation or they get, you know, fire hose, uh, you know, 3,000 rules and regulations, and you got to do this, you got to do that, and sign everything away. And everything. Oh, by the way, here's our core value. Somewhere pumped in the middle of that is where all that is. And, and so what I prefer to do is, like, uh, let them digest this over time and then but also have it uh, to where it's at least seen around so people would know what, what, what they are. Um, you know, it, 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 as big a company as the Boeing company is, is, they plaster that stuff everywhere. It's on every computer. It's on leadership models and, you know, uh, the, the core values and principles, et cetera, all plastered everywhere. But So you can see it, but then you got to actually see it exhibited in the leadership as well. So we'd have, we'd have all of the uh, town hall meetings. We'd have the round table meetings. We'd have uh, all managers meetings once a week as well. And so, you know, it's just, it was just mainly a, a reinforcement process. But then finally we would, you know, about once a quarter we'd get together and, and just say, okay, are we vector and we heading in the right direction or not? And if, if, we're, if we're not, then we got to, what are we going to do to make a course correction? And, yes. you know, and maybe we're not going to turn around completely, but we're going to at least try to just, you know, nudge it a little bit to where uh, things could still continue to be in the positive direction. It's like steering a ship. It is, it is. And yeah. the, the larger the organization is, the harder it is to turn that ship, too. So, you know, which yeah. you need more help with, you know, from everybody else. Absolutely. So, yeah. And, you know, like, as you mentioned, as an organization gets larger, mm -hmm. um, there can be a tendency for the institution to dampen the inspiration. That's right, that's right. How do you keep this from happening? Yeah, well, yeah, it is, uh, can't drive you crazy if uh, you sit around and you think about all the rules and regulations that you got to go through, especially when you're in a large, large organization. Um, but, you know, if you can find and work on the things that you know that you can change, and there's some things that are simply out of your control. And I'm not going to try to go, you know, change the laws of gravity. But, uh, but we, need to, we do know that there are some things that we know we can change, and then we can work on those things. And then once you have a success from the change, and uh, whatever that is, and you celebrate that success, and people say, well, hey, look, they made their, you know, their, their goals, et cetera, and they actually, what a difference, and people would notice that one area, and then it seems to like take, spread like a virus. You know? I say it's a good virus, but it would spread like a virus. Absolutely. Yeah, so. um, I think the Dalai Lama said, if you think you're too small to make a difference, try um, yeah. spending a night with a mosquito. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, sometimes it takes one person who's going to make one change and going to have some results for the others to say, hey, that's right. I want some of that. Mm -hmm. I Absolutely. Want, I need to, how did you do yeah. that? And then they take the change on board. And maybe it's not a giant super leap. You know, maybe you didn't leap a tall building in one single bound, but uh, that's okay. Yeah, so, uh, you know, you got you to take what incremental change you can. Yeah, so. absolutely. So, these ideas, um, this change, you know, ideas for change and how we can do things better, yeah. where, where did they come from in the organization? Well, there's usually some people in the organization that uh, seem to just, they want to do the right thing. They Usually the best ideas come, there's a, always a few people within any team 
that really want to have an idea about how, how to change something. Yeah. And then uh, you know, what you you have to do as a leader, you got to listen to that person. And maybe it's got merit, maybe it doesn't. You know, but at least you know, give them an idea. If if they have that idea, and you have, let them run with it. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And uh, but you you give them all the resources they can to help make it work. Now you don't want total chaos. Um, so, you know, you, you have to have an organized method to go ahead and collect some of these ideas and share them with, with the other team members. And then if you, if within the team itself at all, if everybody is feeling pretty good about it, let's see what happens and, yeah. just, and, and give them the resources they need to make the, make that change. So what is one mistake that you have witnessed yeah. leaders making more frequently than others? Well, the leaders are under pressure as well, and they have leaders that they work for as well and uh, and they're accountable to make things happen and also get results and so but uh, when they exhibit bad behavior when somebody maybe has a good idea and then the leader comes out there and just pounds it down in front of everybody mm. and, uh, and just says oh that's a bunch of crap and uh, and you know and why aren't you just you know don't even think about that work out something else when they're doing that and they're not even listening and they're just you know because they're impatient and they want to go ahead and move on to something else that just squelched that idea probably forever and uh, and so, you know, by, you know, sometimes it drags out meetings, you know, when you're, when people are coming up with different things. And, and, uh, but, but when you have, uh, some of the leaders could just go way overboard, I think, sometimes about just being super negative about, you know, to some of their team. And, uh, and that, that, I think that really hurts. And then the rest of the team sees that. And so when the rest of the team sees that person getting, you know, swatted away, then uh, they're going to say, well, I'm not bringing anything up because look what happened to that person. Yeah. So, yeah. Not only it squashes the ID itself, it also squashes any possibility of other IDs yes, being it's like brought up. That person's in a pool of water, and when they pound that pool of water, there's waves, you know, going to go out through the rest of the pool, yes. and uh, which uh, that's why I think it hurts the others. So. so, in light of that, what do you think is um, the one most important role? job mm -hmm. of the leader? Well, the leader is to help the team be successful. And, uh, and so that, that one thing that they can do is help blend the team, uh, take the team, to continue to take the team in a positive direction. Uh, you know, you, you got to balance the short term and long term, but, you know, again, stay focused on keeping that team blended and moving in a good positive direction. Yeah, absolutely. And it's also about helping the team grow. Yeah, yeah and, yeah. and the individual in the team to grow also. So as, as a leader, mm -hmm. um, and you were saying yourself before, you need to lead by example. What do you do to ensure that you continue to grow and develop as a leader? Well, the, one of the advantages I had during uh, my uh, career at Boeing was uh, it was such a large company, I was able to go work on different things. Mm -hmm. So going from missiles to rocket engines to rockets to satellites to a defense business here to a commercial business here. It's a lot of different things, a lot of different acronyms, actually, that you gotta, you gotta, you gotta keep up with as well. And, yes. But the technologies of all that is, is, you know, something to be. I, I learned a great deal about. It. Yeah. But you know, that was just the technical piece of it. The, the leadership piece of it was, everything was different. Every, when I went from place to place, it was a different situation. I had to adapt myself to to be able to to take that into a positive direction. A lot of times, I was replacing somebody that was, it was fired, and so. Uh, yeah. And when that happened, it was always, uh oh, here comes the hatchet man or something like that. You know, they didn't know what to expect from the leader that was taking the place. But yet that person had to, get, as a leader, you had to go ahead and still get results out of the team, but also take them to a place where the, the previous leader was not able to do that. And so and that happened to me about five times. And, uh, um, and I walk in there and kind of sense out, okay, there's some haters in here and there's uh, some other people that really just want to make change, but they're frustrated with the fact that they were in, in, held back. So you know, how do you go sort out those people? But that's the best way you can do it is by listening to them and getting to know them and, yeah. and seeing what's best for your organization. Were there any resources that uh, that helped you and that you could recommend to the listener? Well, I I, I preferred. I mean, you know, some, I went to training, you know, and, and there was various training classes and stuff like that that I got sent to actually, and I and I was always try to get as much as I could out of the out of the training classes. But I always look at those as kind of like a, a deep immersion. And so, and you get, you know, like say you go someplace for some training class for a week, you come out of it all just fired up, ready to go. I'm going to use that stuff every day. And you find yourself not, not as, uh, 
you lose the enthusiasm after a few weeks because you find that no, nobody else is doing but that you got taught for five days or whatever. So I always felt it was more important to get like a spoonful of it, say, once a month. And so, uh, you know, just take a day a month and just and try to go learn something new from a leadership perspective. Maybe that'll stick with you and not try to learn 23 things during a week. So uh, I always felt like that would stick with you. More. And so, learn one thing and yeah. go apply that one thing. Right. And right. once that's working and you get used to it, mm -hmm. you'll learn something else and then apply it, which is how we do our training. Exactly. Um, in, in our business because you, you need to go and apply, go back to your desk mm -hmm. and now apply what you've learned because as you say, you get excited over when that you go back to your desk and sometimes you can't always find the applicability. Yes. Although I've learned that, how does that translate in my work, in my role now that I'm back at my desk? Yeah. Uh, too hard and I've got this meeting to go to, this phone call, well, I'll deal with it later and, yeah. and nothing gets done and it's a waste. And then you feel like you've changed, and then yet no one else has, but then you got to, so I said, just a little incremental change, I yes. think, and, and incremental learning as well. And I, I sports analogy, don't, you know, I'm a, uh, just, I'm a very bad golfer. And I've tried to play golf, and, you know, they, they tell me, you know, you, there's no hope for you. So, you know, which, you know, okay, <laughs> there's some positive motivation. There. <laughs> but they, you know, so my friend, uh, uh, he's a very good golfer. And so one day we're out at the driving range, sorry about the, sports analogy but uh so anyway so I, I took a few swings at the ball and everything and so he goes you know if you do this 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 and this rattle off about five six things and so he goes you're gonna hit that ball you know three thousand meters and so i was like going oh. i was trying to listen and i was doing all that so i tried them all i missed the ball i mean completely missed it so you know because i was trying to the six things he was telling me to do and so and that's it. i look at that the same thing as is uh, you try to change yourself too much you know, then you're not going to be successful at all. If you try to work on a little bit here and a little bit next week, a little bit the following week, then, you know, maybe there's, there's a way to improve. That's a so, great analogy. So. Really good analogy. And so, you know, that's, that really shows that leadership, mm -hmm. uh, what we learn in leadership for business purposes, mm -hmm. is also applicable to um, other areas in our lives, like sports, for example, right. and how we're going mm -hmm. to learn a new sport. Now, you, um, you mentioned to me that, you, you're married and yes. you have two beautiful children. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, in, in order to, to close this interview, I would love to have your view in terms of, do you feel that your leadership skills come in handy in your family situations or does it go out the window when emotions and feelings are involved? Yeah. Because the idea is that, you know, you, you a leader is who you are and it's not who you are from eight to five, yeah. but it's yeah. who you are all the time. Yeah. Well, I. Sometimes, yeah, and the reason I say sometimes, with my I have, my son is uh, 29, my daughter's uh, 26. My daughter went through some uh, rough times uh, when she was about 18, 19 years old and stuff, but I always displayed confidence in her that she was going to be able to get through that. I always listened to her, didn't really give um, much emotion in the fact that uh, she, you know, uh, how much trouble she could have been in. And so um, she got through that. She's now a wonderful, um, you know, uh, has a bachelor's degree, is getting her master's degree in Switzerland right now. And, uh, and so she's really made her life very special. And my son, um, you know, I, I didn't really push him too hard, but maybe I should have pushed him a little bit more. So maybe I, you know, I needed him, uh, although he's doing very well, he just got married, he's a banker, uh, uh, a private banker for uh, uh, Chase Bank, but, um, and married and just got married and very happy, et cetera. But I feel like uh, he never got that bachelor's degree and I, I wish he would have. And uh, now he's scrambling to go get one kind of at night, uh, you know, with his marriage and, you know, all that stuff going on. It's hard to do after a while. And not that that would be make, a, make him the perfect person or not, but uh, I think it would help him in his, in his, overall, uh, his, his overall corporate yeah. life, I think. Yeah, so, uh, but, you know, there's, but there's other things that, uh, you know, but like what you said, an emotion gets involved, and it's a lot of emotion involved, especially when it's somebody you love like your kids, and, uh, you know, sometimes things can spiral out of control. And, uh, and so, I, you know, but at the end of the day, I'm not going to give my son a raise or a demotion. <laughs> I'm not going to fire him. You know, he's, he's, I'm never going to kick him out of the family. And so, uh, and, uh, and same with my daughter. And uh, so I'm always going to love him. They'll always be part of it. And not that I'm saying I'm going to go fire everybody at work from now on. <laughs> so, uh, but there's some that need it. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, yeah, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, it's about 
helping to make a positive difference in their lives. Just like at work, you try to make a positive difference in the people that you work with in their lives. So that's kind of it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Thank you very much, John. All right. Well, I really appreciate, appreciate it. Yeah. your time. Well, thanks for taking the time and to pick this old brain. So. <laughs> so. Thank you. Okay.